Welcome to the Rob Seco Field Ready Podcast with your host, Jim Robinson. Welcome back to the Rob Seco Field Ready Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Robinson. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about some of the results from 2019 and what it actually causes going into 2020 for uh, what farmers may see due to the repercussions of cover crops and that sort of thing in 2019. I have with us our guest, Kip Rowe. Kip, could you tell us a little about yourself and what you do? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, Kip Rowe, product evaluation lead for Rob Seco in uh, Dakotas, northwest Minnesota and eastern Montana. So give us a little bit of your background. You know, what, what brought you to Rob Seco? What were you doing before Rob Seco? What's a little of your history? Sure. After I graduated from South Dakota State University, I went to work as a crop consultant for 11 years. I uh, came over to Rob Seco in the fall of 2017 and been uh, part of the agronomy team ever since. Excellent. Excellent. So could you tell us a little bit about you know, 2019 was a, a challenging year. We've actually done an episode on the year in review on, on uh, what 2019 looked like. But, you know, what caused 2019? What was the results? And, and what caused a lot of farmers to use cover crops? Yeah, we started out in the fall of 18 extremely wet. Uh, moved into the spring of 19 very wet, which led to a lot of preventive plant acres that then were planted with cover crops. And... Yeah, so you know, with, with the uh, the really wet fall of 2018, really delayed a lot of the field work in the spring of 2019. So you know, made it difficult for growers to plant. A lot of those government programs with the preventive plant uh, program really encouraged growers to use uh, cover crops. But what kind of benefits might the farmers have seen from using the benef- uh, from using cover crops, and what motivated them to move that way? Yeah, for cover crops, some of the main benefits are erosion control. Their organic matter enhancement, uh, increased water infiltration, water holding capacity, and nutrient retention. Uh, used as a forage oftentimes, uh, anybody with livestock, especially this year with the late planting, somebody would need uh, forage for their cattle. And then uh, this year especially, it was very good to hold down weed control in a year where there was some preventive plant that they put wheat cover crops on. Absolutely. And, you know, in some cases we actually saw fields that, that ended up with a cover crop, not intentionally, but from the weeds themselves. So cover crop definitely helped uh, suppress those. Now, when a farmer will use cover crops, what are the typical species that are used in some of those mixes? Yeah, they're using a variety of mixes to try and get different annual grasses in there, uh, such as rye, annual legumes like peas, biennial and perennial legumes, uh, vetches and clovers. And then the brassica species as well, uh, vetch- or, uh, turnips, radishes, those types. What are a couple of the benefits of each of those species? Uh, with your annual rye grasses, one of the benefits there is when you put the cover crop out, uh, it can help with some compaction issues. And then being an annual, it's going to die in the fall. You don't have to worry about it controlling it next spring. Uh, the legumes, you're still getting some of that microbial activity picked up. It's a legume creating nitrogen possible for the next year. Uh, vetches, clovers some legume is activity as well, create nitrogen, hold a mat down, uh, reduce erosion. And turnips and radishes are really used as uh, to get down into that soil profile, try and break up some compaction. And then they also are very good feed value for your your livestock. Absolutely. And now some of the, the cover crop mixes will typically contain some uh, species that will overwinter. So they'll stay greener later into the fall. Uh, They'll green up real early in the spring. Does that create any issues for farmers as they look into uh, insect management or pest control the following year? It certainly does, Jim. Uh, When we start to talk about army worms, cut worms, stock borers, these are all pests that that can cause issues in the spring due to that vegetation that the moth will see is either in the fall when it overwinters and she lays her eggs or we come into the spring as they migrate up north. Now let's start with army worm. So what is it that, that draws the army worm to the cover crop fields? And, and what is it, when is it that they come by and, and uh, lay their eggs? Sure, they prefer dense vegetation for their egg laying. So as they migrate up, it's typically earlier on in the season. It's that March time frame. So they're getting up here early enough, looking for vegetation to, to lay their eggs. Yeah, and then the black cut or the, the different species of cut worms, they'll actually uh, differ in the way that they, you know, some will overwinter, whereas some will uh, deposit their eggs in the, the spring. Can you tell us a little bit about the species we may see? Yeah, the black cut worm, which are typically the more aggressive uh, in my part of the world, especially, they're just like the army worm. They migrate up here 
uh, looking for that vegetation same time around in, in March. Now, dingy cutworms, uh, they overwinter here. Yeah, they're looking for a little bit different. You know, they, they do like some of that vegetation, but they're also going to be more profoundly found on hilltops, light soils, and uh, south-facing slopes. Absolutely. And, you know, with some of these fields that may not have necessarily gotten cover crops planted on them, but may have had a dense ve- vegetation from various weed species, so grasses, ragweed, you know, pigweed, etc., uh, we might see a little bit more stock borer. Can you tell us a touch about those? Yeah, stock borer is just like your your dingy cutworm. It's going to overwinter on the ragweed species, grass species especially. So it, with if we had some fields that didn't have greatest weed control due to wet conditions, couldn't get in there in the fall to do any tillage, the stock borer could be an issue for us as well. Yeah, so a lot of these species, the, uh, the army worm, the black and dingy cutworm, and the common stock borer, they're typically corn pests. And so what might they do to a corn crop that's you know, establishing its stand in the spring? Well, depending on which one, uh, the army worm is going to go in there and they're nocturnal. So they're, they're going to be feeding on it at night, but they're going to be cutting off, the, cutting off the stems and killing the plants. The black and dingy are going to be coming early as well. Uh, they, they don't feed at night as much. They're, they're more during the day and can be feeding at night, but they're going to do the same thing. They're going to clip at that stalk and they're going to kill the plant. Stock bore is a little bit later. Um, it's going to come in as that corn's V5 or higher and, and bore into that stock. Absolutely. So overall, what we may see from these different species is an overall reduction in stand establishment or an overall higher degree of variability in uh, how vigorous plants may be if they're not completely clipped or, or cut. Uh, you know, you could have small runt plants developing that don't contribute to yield at all. Yeah, for sure. Or, or open them up for a vector of diseases, uh, things of that nature. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Now, what are the different management practices that farmers may be able to use in order to either identify or combat these different uh, pests? The most common one that we've been using for years is to scout in the spring. Uh, that's more of an arduous task, labor intensive, especially when you've got when you're talking about the army worm. Some a species that's nocturnal, very hard to find during the day, hides underneath the trash or residue. Uh, cutworms, you can find them during the day, but uh, you're still scouting, and oftentimes you're having patches or areas of missed plants before you really do notice that you have a problem. That's that's absolutely for sure. So you know, once you do identify them, what are some of the control measures that you can do in conventional corn or, or when you have scouted and identified those uh, pests? Yeah, you're coming over with an insecticide, uh, whether it be a pyrethroid or some product like that. Uh, conditions can play into your efficacy of it. You know, if you have very dry soils when you're trying to come in there, uh, your control measures will be less. Uh, so damp soils will help penetrate that uh, insecticide down in there. And do you typically get a, a high level of control? Is it more variable? What what comes out of those insecticidal um, applications? Variable level of control, um, not, uh, not, not high efficacy many times. What other methods of control might, uh, other management practices and technologies might people be able to use in order to control these pests? Yeah, the easiest and uh, most effective for everybody would be to, pl- to plan a hybrid that has a BT gene in it to control these ins- to control these pests. Now there are a couple different BT genes that are typically used uh, in the uh, traded corn world. Uh, what are the ones that may control the cutworm species, and and how they, do they vary in terms of their efficacies? Yeah, the the mo- the one with the broadest adaption or broadest control would be Viptera by far. Um, it's the the only trait that uh, will control true armyworm. Only trait to control dingy cutworm. Uh, now there is uh, Herculex one out there that controls black cutworm, and then uh, you do get just a little bit of control with the uh, Genuity Double Pro. Absolutely. Tell me a little bit more about uh, Viptera. What what is it? You know, what's a little bit of its history, and uh, how does it work? Yes, it's a vegetative insecticidal protein that was derived from Bacillus thuringiensis. So. We all think of BT, we think of corn borer control. Well, this, this is a, another technology that was developed from BT. That's the VIP3A20 protein, and it uh, gives you multi-pest complex control. Absolutely. How many, about how many pests does it control, or about, is it labeled to control? About 14 total. Mm-hmm. And what uh, order of pests? 
uh, the Lepidoptera species. And, and when we define Lepidoptera species, it's insects that are butterflies, moths, uh, the caterpillar insects. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just an interesting tidbit. Now, the VIP3A protein was actually discovered not through uh, the Bacillus thuringiensis that you typically see in the soil, but but one that was actually identified in in a carton of spoiled milk. Just as an interesting side, you know, that's a it was originally purified uh, from spoiled milk and then transformed into corn, which is kind of a fun story, just like penicillin. Uh, so the site of action for Viptera. Uh, does differ a little bit from uh, that of Cry3A, Cry1F, the, the genes that are involved in some of the other traits on the marketplace. So Agersher, corn borer, uh, the genuity traits. You know, can you tell us a little bit about how it actually works within the insect's gut? Yeah, the site of action is it binds to the receptors in the mid-gut and causes poor formation. Uh, it's a very high-dose kill. They must bite into it. But once they bite into it, it's, it's almost immediate death. So with the insects have to actually bite into the plant first, uh, could you see some damage? Uh, and how extensive, could, how extensive could it be before control is actually achieved? Yeah, there definitely could be some damage, uh, a very small percentage, though. Uh, it's such a high-dose kill that you, you typically wouldn't even notice if you were scouting a field of Viptera and it had high cutworm pressure. So you may see a plant that gets stunted, but you're not going to see six or 12 in a row that are, are all clipped. No, it'll be very random and, and, and very unnoticeable. So Agrashir Viptera is found in a couple of different trait sacks in, the, sacks in the marketplace. What are the primary trait sacks, especially those that you can find from Rob Seco, and uh, what all is contained within those stacks? Yeah, our Agrashir Viptera 31 11s are going to have those in there. Uh, you're going to have a corn borer gene in there, and you're also going to have a rootworm gene. Our Agrashir Duracade 5222s also are going to have that in there. Um, you're going to have you're going to have Viptera, and you're going to have corn borer control, and you're also going to have rootworm control. Absolutely. Then you also find the uh, Agrashir Viptera within your 3110s, the Agrashir 3220s, and Agrashir 3330s as well, as well as any of those that may be stacked with Artesian. So with Viptera being derived from Bacillus thuringiensis. Does it also control corn borer on its own? It will not, Jim, and that's why we've always stacked it with other corn borer traits. Uh, in our 3220s, our 3110s, you'll find that we have the corn borer control along with Viptera. So, Kip, so far in our conversation, we've talked about how uh, with the increased prevalence of cover crops due to the prevented plant acres uh, from 2019, that we should see an increase in the amount of pests that we, uh, the prevalence of the pests uh, especially the army, the true army worm, black and dingy cutworm, uh, common stock borer in cornfields that go on to those uh, cover cropped acres from the year before. Uh, and that the growers, if they best want to manage those fields and reduce their risk for uh, damage from those pests, uh, that they should use Agrashir Viptera. So with that, is there anything else you'd like to add? Not really, Jim. I just think the importance of Viptera in 2020 can't be understated. Uh, we, we're farming a lot of acres nowadays. We don't have as much time to scout all these acres. Give yourself that protection up front. Viptera is insurance for, for all these growers going into 2020. Excellent. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. All right. I think that wraps things up for us today. And remember to tune in the 1st and 15th of every month for new episodes. Until then, stay field ready. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Rob Seco Field Ready Podcast. Join us next time to be field ready. A Parkville Media Production.